Lord God, we give you thanks this morning for the scriptures that they're God-breathed. They come from you to us. They're here for our training and our correction, rebuke, and that we would learn how to walk in your ways. Lord, your ways are not our ways. So give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Help us to walk in your ways, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're getting seated, if you brought your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you didn't bring them, there's a pew Bible somewhere nearby, if you would turn to your pew Bible. Little boy asked his father, Daddy, what's a paradox? And he answered very quickly and said, Son, it's when there are two doctors in the same room. <laughs> Honestly, that joke is horrible. I tell good jokes and you don't laugh. I tell a horrible joke and you laugh. I just don't know what to do with you all. <laughs> Paradox. It's, uh, this is what Paul is going to talk about in our text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. And the gospel itself is a paradox. The gospel makes no sense to the world in which we live. The God who has revealed himself in creation, look out the window and see what God has done. Ex nihilo, out of nothing, who created all that there is out of nothing, all powerful God, most fully and completely and finally reveals himself to us in His Son, Jesus Christ, who died an ignominious death on a Roman cross. It makes no sense to the world. The world says it's folly, it is foolishness. And yet, to the Christian, that is the power of God being revealed in this world. It's paradoxical. It doesn't seem to make sense. The author to the letter of Hebrews, you don't need to turn there, but he says this, In these last days... God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He, the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The gospel makes no sense to the world, to the people around us, we wonder sometimes, why don't people respond to the gospel? Because it's foolishness to them. It is utterly crazy. Now, Paul is dealing with some issues here in Corinth, and he had to write them. There are actually three letters to the Corinthians. We don't know where the breaks are and how the pieces fit together, but he has written three letters to the church in Corinth. If there was such a thing as a mainline church, back in the days of Paul, the church in Corinth was a mainline church. They chase fiercely after the spirit of the age. They walk in the wisdom of the world. They are a church in a metropolitan community. They are sophisticates. They are educated. And so, though they have placed their faith in Jesus, some of what Paul says does not make sense to them at all. Paul was the founder of the church. And now Paul finds himself being kicked to the curb. Because now there are super apostles. If you have your Bibles, just look across the page, chapter 3, verse 1. These super apostles do what? Or do we need, Paul, do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you? These super apostles come to Corinth and they bring with them letters of reference and they bring with them all of their titles and all of their diplomas and all of their information. And like the gospel itself, the walk of discipleship and Christian leadership is paradoxical. It was Jesus who said, those who desire to be great in the kingdom shall become the servant of all. Again, that makes no sense to the world. Try this on your resume. The world says that, that what is appropriate, what is good, is what the super apostles were doing. Letters of reference, diplomas, titles. They got their teeth capped. They had perfect hair. They had a Savile Row suit on. And that's how they present themselves. And the world oohs and ahs over these people. And we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh is, but some scholars speculated, we just plug ugly. He was hideous to look at. 
And so that made his presentation of the gospel something of a challenge. Others think that he had a hump on his back and that he was stooped. He had scoliosis. And so that Paul was not. Others think that he had a stutter. And so that when Paul preached and when Paul taught that he did so without power, without dignity, without prestige, without all of the things that the super apostles were bringing to town. And now they're rejecting Paul and the teaching of Paul, and they're no longer following the gospel that Paul taught them, but they're following the wisdom of the world. Go after the tall and the handsome and the articulate and the bright, and that's how I presented myself at the interview. Now you've gotten to know me, and I'm broken, and I'm wrecked, and I'm bruised, and, I'm, and all of those other things. But if, if I'd come to my interview and said, yeah, I'm a loser, nobody would hire me. Nobody does that. And, and, and yet, that's, that's what Paul's going to talk about this morning. Because this is nuts to the world. This is not the way the world works. Well, Paul says, no, it's not the way the world works, but it's the way the kingdom of God works. And we need to pay attention here this morning to what Paul is teaching us. Let's look at verse 5. Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. See, the super apostles proclaim themselves. Look at my resume. Look at my degrees. Look at my letters of reference. Woo! And I'm great. And just ask me while I pat myself on the back. That's the super apostles. Paul says, no, we didn't come to town preaching ourselves. We aren't your Lord. Christ Jesus is your Lord. And then he goes on to say something else, and it's somewhat striking. Verse 5 again. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And English translations, especially American translations, just botch this every time. There are three striking features to this sentence in, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 4, verse 5. Three striking features. The first one is this, that um, you know, it'll come to me in a minute. The word servant is a poor translation. The Greek word is doulos, it's slave. A servant can work for a living. The servant might make meager wages, but the servant gets paid for his or her service. The servant, when the servant has done their shift, the servant gets to go home and they get to live the way they want to live. None of those things is true for a slave. And in America, we eschew the word slave because of the Civil War. Because when we hear slave, we immediately think a race-based, ethnic, chattel slavery like took place in the antebellum South, which provoked the Civil War. That's what we think of when we hear slavery. Slavery practiced in the ancient world was not, not like that. It was still not good for the slave, but it was infinitely better than the chattel slavery practiced in the American South. But in American translations, they drop that word. The word doulos, the word slave, is used over 130 times in the New Testament. And we shy away from that word when it says servant or bond servant. It's actually the Greek word doulos, it's slave. And so the slave is at the mercy of their master. And so the first thing that Paul says is that we are slaves. We are slaves for Jesus Christ's sake. Who wants to sign up to be a slave? Here's the second crazy thing, the striking feature of this. Paul says that you being a slave is a part of the proclamation of the gospel. He says, we proclaim ourselves, not ourselves, we proclaim not ourselves, we proclaim ourselves your slaves for Christ's sake. That he has enslaved himself to the church in Corinth. It's a voluntary enslavement, but he has enslaved himself to that church. There is an unbreakable bond. They're not treating him well. They're kicking him to the curb. They're talking smack about him. They're beating him down. They're breaking his heart. But there's an unbreakable bond there, and Paul is their slave, and he, he doesn't have the right to leave them. He doesn't have the right to reject them. And so he continues on. The third striking feature is that this slavery is part of the proclamation of the gospel. We proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord, and we as slaves for Jesus' sake. Nowhere else in the scriptures, nowhere else in the New Testament does Paul say that he's a slave to any human being. But here he says to the Corinthians, I am your slave. I am helpless. I have, I have nothing to commend me. 
other than my life, which I have poured out for you. That's what Paul is communicating here. And then we go to verse 6. For Jesus' sake, for God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness. That first word, for, in the ESV is the Greek word haughty, and it means for or therefore. Now, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, what do you do? You go back and find out what it's there for. So, because Paul is a slave, that's what he's been talking about. And his sacrifice on behalf of the Corinthians, that's what he's been talking about. So, since Paul is a slave and since he has sacrificed greatly for them, he now moves on in a transition to this new idea in verse 6. God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Paul harkens back to what we began with this morning, to the creation. The all-powerful God who made the entire cosmos out of nothing, that God has called us to be His children and He has let His light shine on us. It also harkens to the new creation. That's what God did before and now God is doing a new thing. And what's the new thing He's doing? It harkens back to Moses. You remember when Moses climbed the mountain? And he spent time with God, and then he came down off the mountain, and his Shekinah glory caused him to glow. He was radioactive. And so he had to wear a veil in the presence of Israel, because his holiness was such that they couldn't bear to look on his face because of the... And that shone on him from the outside. But Paul says here that God in the new creation is doing something incredibly different than that. It's not God shining a spotlight on us and we're on the stage and there's a light following me around as I walk. No, He has placed His light in our hearts and it shines out from within us. Like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The light of God shines out from within us. Not shines on us, but from within us it shines outward. Let the light shine out of darkness. It has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now Paul's making a transition. Here's the disconnect that Paul has experienced with the church in Corinth. They don't get him at all. He planted the church. They're his disciples, but their lives are radically different than his life, and his life makes no sense to them at all. They can't relate to him. They like the super apostles. The super apostles are everything that they hope to be when they grow up. They want to be successful and prestigious and have degrees and, and be impressive, and that's the super apostles. But that's not Paul. If you got your Bibles, just turn a couple of pages. Here's Paul's uh, curriculum vitae. Here's his resume. Chapter 11, beginning at verse 24. Paul says to them, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. I on frequent journeys in danger from rivers and robbers, in danger from my own people, the Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. That's his resume. And they don't get that at all. They've never experienced any of those things. They live in a metropolitan, sophisticated community. What kind of crazy stuff is all of that? And so they look down on Paul because he has been schooled in the school of hard knocks. Now the reality is, among all the apostles, Paul had all the credentials. He's got a PhD, he studied under Gamaliel, he um, was being prepared for a seat on the Sanhedrin among the Jews. If he'd stayed in Jerusalem, he had it made for life. And he walked away from all of those things, and he experienced all of these pains and all of these difficulties. I haven't experienced that, experienced that kind of adversity. You haven't experienced that kind of adversity. For the sake of the gospel, as a slave of Jesus Christ, what it points to in Paul's mind is that he is living out the reality of the gospel. And that comes with rejection from the world. That's the reality of it. 
And the Corinthians, they don't want world rejection. They want accolades. They want to be uh, the recipients of what the world's gifts are to them. Again, they're like the mainline churches, chasing the spirit of the age. They don't get Paul. Now, Paul has made the transition, and the transition takes place in verse 7. He says, we are like jars of clay. Anybody ever get a big tax refund check from the IRS? Do you look forward to the envelope or do you look forward to the check inside the envelope? What do you do with the envelope? You rip that thing to shreds. Get this out of the way so I can get to my check. The big bucks coming to me from the IRS. That's what Paul's talking about. The jar itself is commonplace. The jar itself is irrelevant. I have uh, in the bathroom, in the shower, just a cheap, cheesy plastic bottle. Why? Because I, it's in there not for the plastic bottle, it's for the shampoo that's in the bottle. Or the perfume that's in the bottle. It's not about the bottle, it's not about the container. And Paul is saying, and this is what they don't get, we are the container. Our body, our flesh, is the container in which the treasure resides. Let's listen to verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. And what is the treasure? The end of verse 6. The treasure is that, where to go? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What shines out of us? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And who has it? Paul says, if you're in Christ, we have that. You have that. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in, Jesus, in the face of Jesus Christ. That that is what, that's who resides within you. That's the treasure that you carry around in this jar of clay. And as we age, the jar gets dinged up. It gets cracked. It gets dropped. It has chinks in it. It has cracks in it. And that's the image that Paul wants us to understand. In fact, in verses 8 and 9, he makes it crystal clear. He says, we are afflicted. He says, we are perplexed. He says, we are persecuted. He says, we are struck down. Do those things to a jar of clay and see what happens to the jar. Uh, it becomes a little bit less useful, useful as a, a carrying device because it's now been dropped and cracked and broken. Scott McKnight, a theologian at Northern uh, Seminary in Illinois, uses this image. You're an image of God. You are an icon and you hang on the wall. And the train rumbles past and your icon falls to the floor and it cracks. That's what you are, a cracked icon. You've got a big line running right up through your visage, through your face, through on the icon. Doesn't mean that you're still not an icon, you still are. But that you're cracked, that you are broken, that you are not all together. Anybody ever feel that way? Ever feel cracked or broken or not all together? Listen to this. Have you ever felt, this is 8 and 9 again, have you ever felt afflicted? Have you ever felt perplexed? Have you ever felt persecuted? Have you ever felt struck down? That that is the human experience, but particularly for disciples, it's what it means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. All of these things that Paul is talking about are the things that Jesus himself experienced. And then Paul, in good Jewish parallelism, says, but not, but not, but not. And then he adds four more things. So now let's listen to it all the way. There's a rhythm to this. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. It's a description of Paul and his ministry. It's a description of Jesus and his life and his ministry. It's a description of those who will walk in Paul's and in Jesus' footsteps. That's what the Corinthians are not doing. That's what they don't get. It, if you follow Jesus, it, you're unlikely to be successful in worldly measures. Do you measure things like the world does by noses and nickels and noise? That's what the world cares about. Bigger is better. Be successful. That's what the world cares about. That's not this list. Paul is explaining to them that the values of the kingdom are completely reversed from the values of the world. 
And the sooner that we understand that, the happier all of us will be. And if you are living in the midst of bereavement, if you're living in the midst of adversity, if you're living in, with trials and persecutions and pains and difficulties, these are words of comfort to you in the place where you're living. It's where Paul is living. He loves this church and they're breaking his heart. He has given his life to them and they're essentially spitting on it. So Paul has another image. Turn the page and let's look at verse 10. Crazy, crazy image. We talked about this once in the past. That we always carry in the body of death, death of Jesus. Always carrying in the body, in our, in our jar of clay, the death of Jesus. One of the punishments in the ancient world for murder is that they don't execute you. You get to live, but they strap the corpse of the person whom you killed to your body. They tie it to your arms and to your legs, and as it rots and decays, you walk around with this dead body, this corpse. What an image Paul is giving us here. And his listeners understood that. And it, it, it's decaying. It stinks. They smell you from a mile away. You ever smell weak old roadkill that the sun's beaten down on? That's, that's what you're wearing on your back. Jesus said, take up your cross. If you want to be my disciples, take up your cross daily and follow me. Paul says, if you want to be his disciple, put on the dead body of Jesus himself. And then why? Because Paul gives us the answer to that question. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest. Because Paul is carrying the stripes of Jesus and the pains of Jesus and the struggles of Jesus and the adversity of Jesus. Because he was willing to endure all of those things, the Corinthians have experienced life and rebirth and and new creation and all of those things that we receive when we come to faith in Jesus. But it isn't one mountaintop after another after another. There's a movie, and I can't stand it, the Kendrick brothers fighting the giants. It is absolutely disgusting. The woman is barren. The guy's a loser football coach. He's 0-11. He's 0-11. And then they say the sinner's prayer. And two hours later, by the end of the movie, she's got two kids, and he has two state football championships in Texas. All you got to do is say the sinner's prayer, and your life will be wonderful, and everything will be glorious. I don't know what gospel they're reading, but it isn't the New Testament. It's not here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That movie is dreck. Caleb and I, my middle son, we sat in the front row and we were mocking the movie the whole way through. This is ridiculous. And then they turned the lights on and we turned around and everybody said, Oh, it's so beautiful. What? Two children and two state champion football things on the mantelpiece. Is that what Paul's talking about here? That's worldly success. No, Paul says that we're broken. Paul says we're crushed. Paul says in our bodies we are beaten down. And that God uses that. Why? Because God's power is made manifest in our brokenness, in our weakness. It's not our power, it's His power. He's making it clear He's the master, we're the slaves. His power is available, His power is at work in the world. His power created the cosmos. But it's His power. Who gets the glory when, when miracles happen? He does. It's His power, His glory, not ours. But we're like the world. We want all of that. We want the accolades. We want the attention. We want, we want all of those things that, that we think will satisfy us. And Paul says, no. We empty ourselves of those things. You want to make a difference in the world in which you live? Take the lid off your jar. Let the glory of the, of the face of Jesus shine forth, not just out of the top of the jar, but also out of all of the cracks and all of the breaks and all of the chinks because as you are filled with the light of Christ that light leaks out all over the place. That's the image Paul wants us to get. 
He's not promising us state football championships and children. He's promising us that as we are faithful to Jesus Christ in our jars of clay, that God's glory will shine forth from us, and in that, God's power, God's power is made manifest, not ours. God's glory is made known to the world, not ours. That's Paul's message to the church in Corinth, and he's trying to help them to understand. He's going to continue to talk about these things over the course of his letters, but they don't get it. They haven't experienced things the same way that Paul has. And the question for us as 21st century comfortable Americans, we live in Pinehurst. Um, Francis Schaeffer said that the goal of most Americans is personal peace and affluence. Leave me alone with enough money so I can golf every day. That's Pinehurst. Personal peace and affluence is the goal of life. That's not what Paul says. Paul says we're jars of clay and that we contain a treasure and that the treasure is ours to give away. Amen.